It is therefore now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Part two of Global TV's Carolyn Jarvis's expose on Ontario's probation system was just as disturbing and shocking as the first part. So I want to be very clear. The member from Ottawa Centre led the Ministry of Community and Safety and Correctional Services for two years. He is currently the top legal officer in the province. He can pass the buck to someone who's been on the job less than five months, or he can own up to the systemic failure in the system that he oversaw for two years. A failure that was outlined in the scathing Auditor General's report and a follow-up report that showed he didn't solve the disaster in our probation system. This is his mess. He should take responsibility. Here, here. So, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier: Will you fire your Attorney General? No, Mr. Speaker, I will not do that. And uh, obviously, there are uh, there are situations that are of great concern to all of us, Mr. Speaker, and we uh, we are uh, working to uh, to deal with those, Mr. Speaker. But you know, in partnership with uh, with our police services and justice partners, we've made. Ontario, one of the safest jurisdictions in North America, Mr. Speaker, and that is a testament to the work of our police services, Mr. Speaker. It is a testament to the work of our parole, parole officers, our probation officers, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that we have people working in this province who have made this one of the safest jurisdictions in uh, in Canada, Mr. Speaker, and Ontario is also home to six of the ten safest census metropolitan areas in the country, Mr. Speaker. So I am very proud of the work that is done by the yes, people sir. who keep our community safe, Mr. Speaker. Are there situations? Are there disturbing situations that need to be dealt with? Absolutely. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. I'm sorry, that's not good enough, Mr. Speaker. The reality is our probation officers are saying that our communities aren't safe because this government has not taken this seriously. Let me give another example. Look at the story from yesterday's report. Kyle McLaughlin was convicted of child luring in 2013. He was sentenced to 18 months in jail, three years of probation. But just two years later, he committed the same crime. This is child luring. This is, according to sources, not once did a probation or police officer check in on him in the community to make sure he was following the rules of his, of his release. Our probation officers are saying there's a major risk to community safety here. Can you imagine that? Someone who's convicted of child luring and is out on probation and there's no one checking up on him? It's ridiculous. It's offensive. And yesterday, this government question. laughed when I asked this question. I want them to take it seriously. I want the Premier to understand that our community is at risk, children are at risk, and will the Premier do the right thing and fire our attorney general? <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, let, me, let me just say off the top that our Attorney General is one of the strongest men with integrity in this province, Mr. Speaker. He works hard. He works tirelessly for his constituency and for the people of Ontario. And, Mr. Speaker, our Attorney General is in politics because he believes in social justice. He believes that we can make Ontario better. And he also believes, Mr. Speaker, that the rule of law is what we need to follow. He also believes, Mr. Speaker, that government has a role to play in putting the protections in place for families across the province. He does not believe, Mr. Speaker, he does not believe that filling our jails, Mr. Speaker, that that vilifying and criminalizing every action of uh, young people, people in our province, Mr. Speaker, that that is that is the way to go. We need to transform our system. He is leading that transformation along with our Minister of Community yes, Safety and Correctional Services, Mr. Speaker, and I understand. Understand. I understand that it is easier for the leader of the opposition. Thank you. The leader of the opposition. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. I just gave you an example. An example where someone was convicted of child luring and went out and committed the same offence. And your response was to praise your Attorney General for the great job he's doing. They have dropped the ball. They have failed the test of leadership. Our communities are not safe because they've neglected to make sure there are not loopholes. And let me give you an example of what they said yesterday. You know, the Attorney General said it's not him, it's another minister. And that minister said, I wish there was never an area we need to improve, but it does happen. 
Chief Governor Whip. It does Whip. happen? Can you believe that's the response? It does happen. Our communities are at risk, and it's okay. It does happen. I want them to clean up the mess. I want them to close the loopholes, and I'm going to ask the Premier again. We have, we have dangerous criminals who aren't being checked up on, and someone's got to be accountable. This expose was shocking. So, Mr. Speaker, to the Premier, Question. knowing that our community is at risk, will you hold someone accountable for this incredible negligence and incompetence? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I never said that there weren't disturbing situations. In fact, I led my answer with saying that there are disturbing situations. Of course, there's more that we can do, Mr. Speaker. I take this very seriously, as does our Attorney General, as does our Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. But, Mr. Speaker, the fact is that we have one of the safest jurisdictions in North America. The fact is that we are hiring more officers, Mr. Speaker. We are putting more resources in place. And, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to work to keep our province one of the safest, if not the safest, in North America, Mr. Speaker. But what I will not do is buy into rhetoric that vilifies one person, Mr. Speaker, as though somehow that is the solution to systemic issues. And I would ask the Leader of the Opposition to look at his record as a member of the Harper government, yeah. Mr. Speaker. Tell us, tell us, tell us. New question, leader of the leader of the opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. I've had the privilege of meeting hundreds of nurses this week as we celebrate Nurses Week in Ontario. They share me stories, countless stories, of how they want a government that supports and defends our province's nurses. Not a government that attacks the health care system. Just look at the last two years. This government has fired 1,600 nurses. 1,600 nurses. Mr. Speaker, how does the Premier reconcile the fact during this Nurses Week that her government has fired 1,600 nurses? Mr. Speaker, um uh, you know, I, uh, I want to just say to all of the nurses in the province that we value their work, Mr. Speaker. We understand how critical that work is to uh, families across the province. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm about to have a nurse in my own family. My, uh, my youngest daughter is going to graduate from nursing this June, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. And I am more than proud. I am more than proud that she has chosen that uh, that career, Mr. Speaker. So. We will continue to invest in the, uh, the health care personnel in this province, Mr. Speaker. We've made a huge investment in our budget, a $7 billion boost to the health care system, Mr. Speaker. That will mean that there will be more personnel, that hospitals will be able to, uh, to deal with the challenges that they have, Mr. Speaker, including hiring uh, more health care personnel frontline. Mr. Speaker, we have hired more nurses. We will continue to hire more nurses. We've also, we've also listened to nurses when they've talked to us about pres uh, the, their scope of practice. We've increased their scope of practice, and that makes the health care system Thank work you. better, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, not only did they fire 1,600 nurses in the last two years, they continued to fire nurses despite the fact a report, and this is shocking, a report, Mr. Speaker, from the Canadian Institute for Health Information, I think everyone trusts CIHI, confirmed a dangerous reality about health care services first identified by RNAO. And what this CIHI report said is Ontario's RN to population ratio is now the worst in Canada. So no matter what spin the Premier gives, because of these firing of nurses, we have the worst, the absolute worst RN to population ratio in Canada. And so, Mr. Speaker, can the Premier please tell us, can she please reconcile to us why here during Nurses Week, that right now in Ontario, she is proud of the fact that her government has overseen Ontario having the lowest RN to population ratio in Canada? Thank you. Thank you. So 
Well, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition is uh, assiduously only talking about RNs. He is not talking about nurse practitioners, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. He is not talking about she RPNs, Mr. Mr. Speaker. The reality is that since 2003, more than 28,949 nurses have been under work in In 2016, the number of nurses employed in nursing in Ontario increased for the 12th consecutive year. Wow. Every single year, Mr. Speaker, more nurses have been hired. And Mr. Speaker, that was necessary because when this government came into office under my predecessor, there had been nurses slashed, there had been nurses demeaned across this province, and there was a huge gap. That's why there are 28,900 more nurses working in Ontario than there were when we came into office. And every year, Answer. Mr. Speaker, more nurses are hired, and we will continue on that track, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. And since I can't get uh, an answer on the nurse firings, Remember one of the things I, I heard this week when it came to Nursing Week, you know, I was visiting the Vanier Centre for Women, the correctional, um, a, a, the correctional Institute, and I also visited oncology at SickKids. And there was one common thing that was raised to me from the RNs, and they said they couldn't believe the government's oversight that they weren't, they were not included in the PTSD legislation. Listen, these nurses have to see things we never want to see. They are affected, and the government's been saying they're going to look at it. Maybe, maybe down the road. I'm telling you, Mr. Speaker, we need nurses to be included in the PTSD yeah, yeah. legislation. It's the right thing to do. No more delays. Can today, can we get a commitment and a promise from the Premier that no longer will there be this oversight? 8,000 nurses have signed the petition pleading with the government to include them in the PTD, PTSD legislation. Right. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier give us that assurance today and do the right thing? Question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Of Labor. Speaker, thank you very much to the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition for that question. I would ask where the Leader of the Opposition was a year ago when we were passing this legislation, Speaker. That was the time to bring it forward, when we honoured our first responders, our, when we honoured our firefighters, our police officers, our corrections officers, our nurses in correction facilities. You sat on your hands. The, uh, the third party helped us. <clears throat> To the chair, please. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, we are dealing with all the first responders. Nurses in correctional facilities are covered under PTSD legislation. So you should do your homework. You should do your homework before you ask questions like this. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Start New question. Member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. <laughs> to the Premier. Yesterday, in a self-congratulatory press conference, the Minister of Energy touted the Liberal government's short-sighted decision to sell off yet another batch of Hydro One shares. What he neglected to mention, though, was that the further privatization of our hydro system will ensure that hydro bills for everyday Ontario families will continue to climb. Why are the Premier and her Minister of Energy so excited that families who are already struggling will be left further behind? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, um, I know that the, uh, the member of the third party understands that building infrastructure in this province is important. He lives in a, an urban riding, Mr. Speaker. He represents an urban riding that needs those uh, investments, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, we continue to make investments in transit. In Mr. Police Premier. Mr. Speaker, that the net proceeds will be uh, reinvested in new infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, and I know he supports investing in infrastructure. So, Mr. Speaker, we made a decision to maximize the value of our assets in order to make those critical new infrastructure investments. We are going to continue Answer. to do that, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. <laughs> 
Thank you again to the Premier. The loss of the province's majority stake in Hydro One will cost Ontarians dearly. People's hydro bills will keep going up. Member from Beaches East York. And they will lose out on the services that revenue from Hydro One used to pay for. Our hospitals, schools, long-term care homes are already at a tipping point because of Liberal cuts. The sell-off will make the situation even worse. How can the Premier justify this boondoggle for Bay Street investors at the expense of the people of Ontario? Thank you. Premier, thank you. Minister of Energy. Thank you. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, pleased to rise to talk about what we're doing to continue to make rates affordable for all Ontarians across the province, Mr. Speaker. The Ontario Fair Hydro Plan has already reduced rates by 17 per cent. They've seen that by. Carry on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, once again, I'll repeat, rates have dropped down as of May 1st, down by 17 per cent compared to last year and by July 1st of this year, Mr. Speaker. Um, if passed through the legislation, we will see an additional 8 per cent, bringing that total on average to 25 per cent. But, you know, Mr. Speaker, the media know, I know the opposition know, the official opposition yes, know that rates are set by the OEB. It's too bad that the third party doesn't understand that component. Thank you. Final supplementary. Yeah, well, clearly the minister doesn't know how energy works in this province. Speaker, the Premier has no mandate to sell off Hydro One. It will hurt everyday families. It will put further strain on our public services. She knows that 80 per cent of Ontarians oppose this sell-off, and yet she insists on moving forward. Why is the Premier allowing already wealthy Bay Street investors to get filthy rich off the backs of ordinary Ontario families? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it's, it's not just this party that you know understands how the electricity system works, Mr. Speaker. We've been working hard with stakeholders throughout the province to come forward with a fair hydro plan that's going to reduce rates by 25 per cent. And I know the opposition, the third party, Mr. Speaker, can't understand how uh, the OEB applies the rates. They can go to their website. It's explained there very clearly, Mr. Speaker. But the criticism, what's interesting, Mr. Speaker, with of uh, their obsession with uh, Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, is even more harsh. From Tim uh, Kildas of the Globe and Mail calls the belief that ownership of utilities in Ontario affecting rates one of the biggest misconceptions about electricity. Even Brady Yosh, an economist of the Consumer Policy Institute and frequent government critic, calls the idea of privatization increases rates as a straw man, Mr. Speaker. You know what? When it comes to doing right for yes, the people sir. of Ontario, we're building infrastructure, we're building the hospitals, we're building the schools because we have a plan to build Ontario up, Thank you. unlike the opposition parties, Mr. Speaker. New question. The member from Nickelbelt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. My question is for the Premier. Yesterday, Ontarian learned about 87 years old Ralphina Delra. Ralphina was admitted to the Brenton Civic Hospital, but before she was moved into a hospital room, she spent five long days in the hallway of the ER. Does the Premier think that a sick elderly woman like Ralphina should be seen by her doctor in a public hallway of the busiest emergency room in Ontario? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> I believe that, uh, that she and every other patient in Ontario deserves the very best care, Mr. Speaker, and I, and I believe that uh, physicians should have the opportunity to see their patients in the, uh, the best circumstances, Mr. Speaker. We recognize that hospitals need support, that they need an injection of, uh, of funding, Mr. Speaker, which is exactly why $500 million in funding is included in our budget to go directly to hospitals. That means uh, a minimum 2% increase across the board, Mr. Speaker, for every hospital, but across the board it's more than a 3% increase to hospitals' budgets, Mr. Speaker. And that's on top of the $495 million that was already put on their base last year, Mr. Speaker. So we recognize that there is a need. That's why our budget addresses it. 
Thank you. Supplementary. By the time Rafina finally got her hospital room, her doctor told her family that she was severely dehydrated and that her stay in the hallway of the ER had made her respiratory condition worse. Rafina never got better. She died at Brampton Civic Hospital. Does the Premier see the connection between her years of frozen hospital budget, her years of cut to frontline healthcare workers, and the heartbreaking stories like Ralphina. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, um, you know, this is a tragic situation, and I'm, uh, I'm very sorry to hear about it, Mr. Speaker. I, uh, what I recognize and what our government and our budget recognizes is that there is a need to uh, put a direct investment in, uh, in hospital funding, Mr. Speaker, to increase that base, particularly, Mr. Speaker, in high-growth areas. And I believe the member of the third party said that this is a Brampton uh, hospital, Mr. Speaker. This is, this is one of the highest growth areas in the province, and so we have recognized, on top of the general injection of uh, funding into hospitals, we've recognized that those high growth areas, Mr. Speaker, need an additional amount of support. So, Mr. Speaker, of course, there should be support for every patient across the province. That is what we strive for, Mr. Speaker. That's why our budget addresses the Answer. challenges that hospitals are facing right now, Mr. Speaker. And final supplement. Brampton Civic Hospital said it point blank. They are overburdened by the large number of patients coming into the emergency department. Their ER sees on average 400 people per day. This is 160 per cent more than what they were built to care for. The vice president of medical affairs is even blunter. He says they need at least 200 more beds in the short term and 600 in the long term just to keep up with what they have right now. Does the Premier plan to address this crisis in Toronto, in the GTA, like what's happening at Brampton Civic? Mr. Speaker, again, I say to the, I say to the member opposite that, uh, that we understand that not only does there need to be an increase to, uh, to the base funding of hospitals, which we have put in place, $500 million on top of the $495 uh, million that was put in place last year, Mr. Speaker, and we recognize that in high growth areas there is a need for building. I was at, uh, at the Trillium uh, Health Centre, Mr. Speaker, announcing that we would be investing in uh, an increase in beds, Mr. Speaker, because we recognize, particularly in the communities, and the member of the third party acknowledges the, the GTA, where there is that high population growth, Mr. Speaker, that we need to make capital investments as well. We are doing that. We recognize the challenge, Mr. Speaker. Answer. It's exactly why our budget has addressed those issues. Thank you. New question, the member from Lanark, Front Lennox and Adam. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, after 10 years, I thought I'd seen every imaginable government incompetence, but that all changed last week. Speaker, Maureen, who is a constituent, tried to trade in her car, but it turns out that Fred and Pebbles Flintstone have a lien registered against it. Maureen received her used vehicle information package from Service Ontario, which showed no liens on the car. However, the car dealer would not pay her because the Ministry of Government and Consumer Services had registered a lien against her valid VID number in the names of Fred and Pebbles Flintstone. <laughs> the documents prove that there are other false liens in place on more vehicles. Speaker, why did the ministry register liens on valid VINs in the names of Fred and Pebbles Flintstone, <laughs> who live on the Yellow Question. Brick Road? But why did it take nine months to get it fixed? Thank you. Minister of Government and Consumer Services. And thank you, Speaker. Services. I want to thank the member opposite for the question. As he knows, when I uh, heard about this issue yesterday, I said I was on top of it. I got to the bottom of it, and that's what I've done. So, what's happened, Speaker, is uh, Service Ontario was contacted by this individual in March, and the ministry discharged discharge Aline at that time. And we understand she has since successfully sold her car. It appears what happened in this case, Speaker, that testing was done and test liens were entered into the system by a technician, so it's a human error in relation to these VINs. They were not, these testing uh, 
uh, performers were not removed immediately, and Service Ontario, of course, is reviewing what happened. Uh, to my knowledge, there's been no other similar cases, but I am committed to making sure that the right protocols Answer. are in place going forward. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again, to the Premier. Clearly, we all knew that this was an act of gross incompetence, as everyone knows that the Flintstones live on Rocky Road in Bedrock, USA, and Fred drives a footmobile, not a 2006 Chev Uplander. I had contacted Carproof, who carries the PPSR database. They were informed by this government that Maureen would have to hire a lawyer to expunge these liens. Speaker, how many more mystery machines have had liens placed on them in the names of Scooby-Doo and the gang and other Saturday morning cartoon personalities? Speaker, I'm glad that the minister has worked on this and guaranteed to expunge this false and animated lien against Maureen. But will she guarantee that others affected by this, these Looney Tunes shenanigans Question. won't take nine months to get fixed? Thank you. Please. Thank you. Minister. Well, Speaker, I appreciate. I appreciate the member opposite sense of humor. I do take the issue very seriously as a minister of government and consumer services. And as I said before, to my knowledge, this has not happened before. And I'm making sure that it doesn't happen again. And I understand, I heard this morning, that uh, his constituent is very pleased with the information she received of late from Service Ontario. And uh, uh, just for information as well, when a lien is removed, it gen it's generally displays on the system for 60 days and showing it's been discharged. And once that lien is discharged, I want to emphasize too, it does not affect an individual's ability to sell their vehicle. So I thank the member for bringing this to uh, my attention yesterday, and Service Ontario will continue to provide any information he may need to respond to uh, his constituent. Thank you. Thank you. So, new question. The member from Alberta, Manitoba. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier this morning. Yesterday, the Premier was in Sault Ste. Marie after conveniently forgetting to mention her lack of action on the Ring of Fire. She was asked by a reporter what was going on with the one billion she promised for development. The Premier said, that billion is available, it's there. Can the Premier tell us exactly where the money is since it didn't appear in her budget this year? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, we have committed a billion dollars to building infrastructure in order to open up the, the Ring of Fire. What I also said yesterday, because uh, the, uh, the member of the third party has not taken the whole transcript, what I also said was that we are working with the Matawa First Nations, Mr. Speaker. We are determined that this development will be done in conjunction with First Nations. I also said that our history in this province and in this country is riddled it is riddled with bad examples of not working with First Nations, Mr. Speaker, of not stewarding the land, of not being a partner, if, of not sharing the resources and the wealth of this land with First Nations, Mr. Speaker. We're not going to do that again. We are going to work in conjunction with First Nations. We are going to work to open up those communities because, of course, this is about the wealth that's in the ground in the Ring of Fire, but it's also about the economic development of those communities that circle that very, very treasure that's in the land. Please. Supplementary. I'm still looking for that money in the budget. This is just this is just another example of the premier making big promises and not following through. She was bragging about her budget would help the north, while at the same time there is no money at all for the Ring of Fire. When will this premier learn that the people of Ontario see her through her, de her desperate political tactics and start walking the walk, in addition to talking the talk? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, 
I was very clear yesterday, and I'm clear today, and I know that all of our members have been very clear. That billion dollars has been allocated. It is there, Mr. Speaker. It is there to build the infrastructure to get uh, going on that road, Mr. Speaker. On page 73, there's a reference to that money, Mr. Speaker. We have been working with the First Nations. We will continue to do that, Mr. Speaker. And when I was in Sault Ste. Marie rest yesterday, Mr. Speaker, I was actually correcting what had been said by uh, members of the opposition that were in fact. Um, information that was in fact not accurate, Mr. Speaker, because that money has not been removed. We are committed to investing in the Ring of Fire. We're working with the First Nations, and I'm sorry if the third party and the opposition don't think that that's a worthwhile endeavour. We know, Mr. Speaker, that if we are actually going to live up to truth and reconciliation in this country, yes, then province by province, territory by territory, we have to change the relationship Thank between you. Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you. New question. The member from Barrie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour. Speaker, yesterday in the House, we heard the minister respond to the leader of the opposition and refer to the PCs' Bill 83. Upon reading this bill, I too find myself wondering how the opposition could speak about protecting Ontario's workers while Bill 83. Re Stop the clock. I uh, have dealt with this yesterday. I'm dealing with it today. It will be on government policy, please. Okay. Keep reading. Keep reading. Keep reading. This, this seems incredibly troubling. How could a bill that would abolish card-based certification and disrupt labour relations in the construction industry be supported uh, by others now, and it now pretends to care about labour issues? This bill comes. This bill uh, refers to union members as predators and implies that unions are undemocratic. Could the minister speak to clarify Question. the implications of Bill 83? Thank you, yeah. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for that important question. Speaker, uh, I agree with the member. It was puzzling as me, uh, to me as Minister of Labour. I try to work with the opposition parties, but some days it's hard to figure them out, Speaker. We've got Private Members Bill 83 coming forward, Speaker. The policy of this government, Speaker, and the policy of this government for a number of years has been card-based certification in construction. We have that policy, Speaker, because it makes sense. It's an industry that's mobile. Come to order. Finish, please. Thank you, Speaker. It's an industry that is mobile. It's got projects that are often limited in duration. Our building trade unions, our construction unions work in partnership with incredibly successful Ontario companies. They fought long and hard for this process. And I don't agree with any member of this yes, House that thinks it should be taken away. Bill 83 simply is not government policy, and it doesn't benefit workers in this province. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for your answer and your passion on this topic. It is clear that, that this bill would be a step in the wrong direction. Under our labour law, it would take us backwards in labour relations in this province in a time when it is imperative to modernize and innovate. Mr. Speaker, we continue to hear more and more about how the world of work is changing. In today's workplace, people are no longer keeping traditional nine-to-five business days or taking weekends off. It is common for Ontarians to be self-employed or have part-time or temporary employment. That's right. We need to ensure that we do all that we can to provide support for these changing workplaces. Minister, idea. can you please elaborate on what you're doing to address these changes and challenges that they present? Thank you. Minister Blair. Thank you for the supplemental. I'm happy to stand in the House this morning to speak on this very, very important issue. Speaker, we all in this House know that the world of work is changing. We're facing challenges that uh, you know, they're presenting themselves head on, Speaker, as those changes take place. We started this very important conversation with the people of Ontario about two years ago. We talked to advocates, we talked to organized labour, businesses, workers about we want, what we wanted our labour and employment laws to look like. And we know that fundamental changes are needed. 
needed to create that sustainable framework where everybody in Ontario gets to share in the economic su success of this province. Because we've got to stay competitive in this fast-paced global economy, but we need to protect workers while we do that, Speaker. We need to give them the protection they need and the protection they, de they deserve. And we want to reward those employers, those excellent employers in the province. Answer. They need a level playing field, Speaker, the ones that obey the law, Speaker. I have the final report. I look forward to bringing it to the House very Thank soon. Thank you. New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. In the recently launched Anti-Racism Directorate, the Minister addresses the need to stop systemic racism and discrimination against a number of communities. Yet there is no mention of the in this plan to combat anti-Semitism to help the Jewish community, a community that is still one of the most targeted in Canada. And many Jewish community groups have come and raised this concern, not only with the government but with the opposition. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier ensure the Jewish community in Ontario will be included in the ongoing work of the Anti-Racism Directorate? And will the Premier ensure that the education on anti-Semitism is offered in all educational programs the Directorate will aim to implement? Thank you. Premier. Absolutely, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it is, um, I think it is a solid assumption of, uh, I would say, everyone in this House, Mr. Speaker, that as we fight systemic racism, that anti-Semitism is absolutely central to that, uh, to that struggle, Mr. Speaker, and we would never step away from that. We will continue to work uh, to make sure that wherever, wherever there is racism, um, whether it's whether it is uh, anti-Semitism or whether it is Islamophobia or whether it's anti-black racism, Mr. Speaker, that we root that out and that we make sure that our young people, as they go through school, you know, Mr. Speaker, we put in place an equity and inclusive education strategy many years ago to restore equity and uh, anti-racism education within the education system, Mr. Speaker, because it had been removed, and we are absolutely committed Answer. to doing that across society, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, uh, and I think it is straightforward that we would all make that assumption. That's why it was surprising that there was this oversight initially. And I'm encouraged the Premier is, is, is saying that they will correct this oversight. But the reality is the Jewish community continues to be one of the most targeted groups when it comes to hate crimes in Ontario. In the latest Toronto Police Services report alone, the Jewish Chief community Whip, was the target time. of 43 of 145 hate crime offences in 2016, meaning that 30 per cent of the offences were directed towards the Jewish community. Similarly, in Hamilton, 21 out of 115 reported hate crimes in the year of 2016 were directed towards the Jewish community. These are not isolated incidences, and certainly the Jewish community is a target of hate. Mr. Speaker, uh, and that's why I'm asking the Premier to guarantee, to ensure this legislature, the Jewish community will and, and and to get a commitment from the government will make an amendment that this oversight will be corrected. Can we get a commitment to an amendment on their legislation that will be supported by the Premier and all the members? Premier, please. Be seated, please. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, um, there is a pattern developing. Um, it is very important that uh, Every time there is something said that actually is not accurate, Mr. Speaker, that we yeah. counter that because I do believe that the truth and facts really matter in Ontario. And so, Mr. Speaker, let me read from the anti racism strategy, Mr. Speaker, um, on page one. Premier. Let me just read from uh, the anti-racism strategy, page 171 in the budget document, Mr. Speaker. There are four points, and then the fifth point that uh, outlines what's part of the strategy says, public education and awareness initiatives are targeting racism, including Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. Mr. Speaker, it is right there. You see it, please? You see it, please? New question, the member from Hamilton Mountain. 
Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Children needing developmental services are made to jump through hoops to get the supports they need. Families go into debt and are threatened with losing treatment because their money that they've been promised doesn't come. Cuts to special education means schools are understaffed and unable to provide the supports they need. As families struggle through teenage years, they're burdened with the thought of what's to come as their child becomes an adult and their services are lost. Speaker, in 2004, the Select Committee on Developmental Services recommended that recipients of special services at home funding not lose that funding before passport funding is in place. When will the Premier act to ensure that essential services continue for vulnerable young adults? Thank you. Minister, Minister of Community and Social Services. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Minister of Community and Social Services. Very much, Mr. Speaker. And at first, I would like to acknowledge the great respect that I, my ministry, and this government has uh, for those families who do care for their loved ones with developmental disabilities. And that's precisely why uh, we have doubled, more than doubled, our budget since we took office to look, provide those supports and services for those with developmental disabilities. Uh, the member did refer to the passport program. This was a program that our government government initiated in 2005-2006. Initially, those most in need were accommodated, some 800 people. Through the years, we have grown that program considerably. And with the $810 million in the 2014 budget, we were able Answer. to increase some 13,000 individuals receiving passport for a grand total now of 24,000 people receiving Thank you. that wow. support. Sure. Supplementary, the member from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. These people need action, not platitudes from this government. <laughs> Families have come here today to rally and fight for their children. They're here because their adult children are waiting years for the developmental services they need. Parents and other family caregivers are scrambling for support. Some have had to quit their jobs to pick up the slack created by your government. Right now, there are 11,000 waiting for passport funding, with no guarantee it will ever come. 14,000 are waiting for supportive housing. Some can wait 22 years or more. Your government brags about eliminating the wait list from three years ago, but the crisis in developmental services is still here and it's growing. When will your government eliminate the wait list Question. for developmental services and actually support these families? Well, Mr. Speaker, it sounds like the member opposite will be supporting our budget this year because uh, we are proposing some $677 million in addition to the $2.1 billion that we already provide. And of course, we are taking action. In fact, uh, again, in terms of the passport waiting list, what we do is we ensure that priority cases receive passport funding first. They're prioritized very carefully according to their unique needs and their risk factors. And individuals with the highest needs receive funding in as little as seven days, with about 75% receiving funding within six months. We're working very hard on the residential support side, and this year's budget does include a component to particularly serve those who may be inappropriately housed in long-term care or Answer. hospitals or even in correctional facilities. Thank where you. Our government is full of action. Thank you. New question, the member from Beaches East Shore. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Northern Mines, Northern Development and Mines. We are fortunate, of course, Speaker, that in Ontario we have an abundance of natural resources, including rich mineral deposits that support our province's mining industry and our manufacturing sectors. And according to the Ontario Mining Association, Ontario was number one in mineral production in Canada in 2015, producing far more than a quarter of the national total. And the value of this mineral production has gone up from. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, and the member from Leeds, Grenville will come to order. Well, thank you. 
Speaker, and I was saying that the value of the mineral production has gone up from 5.7 billion dollars in 2003 to 10.8 billion in 2015. Wow. Wow. And our government is continuously working to support the mining industry in all areas across the province. Question. There are a number of programs in place to support our developing and modernizing industry, and Ontarians want to know how the government is taking steps to ensure that our industry will continue to be a national leader. Minister of Northern Development and Mines. The speaker, thank you very much for the question. I want to thank the member for that. I, Northern municipalities, Speaker, uh, dozens of them understand the importance of the mining industry and, and the forest industry to their economies and their regional economies. That's why, for a very long time, a number of years now, we have had a flagship program in place to support not only mining but the large industrials across Northern Ontario. Speaker, we call it the Northern Industrial Electricity Rate Program, or NEAR. Speaker, that program is permanent. It provides on an annual basis a guaranteed $120 million to help large industrials in Northern Ontario deal with their energy costs. That can represent as much as a 25 per cent reduction for these large uh, industrials in Northern Ontario. Speaker, the NEAR program alone, since its inception, has supported large industrials in Northern Ontario to the tune of $730 million. Speaker, that is a massive investment in large industrials in Northern Ontario, yes, specifically today dealing with the mining sector. Lots of other programs in place as well that perhaps I'll have an opportunity in the supplementary thank you. to reference. Thank supplementary. You. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you, uh, Speaker, through you to the Minister for the great work he is doing to advance the mining industry in Northern Ontario and explaining how the program, the Northern Industrial Electricity Rate Program, is working and helping my constituents in Beaches, East York, and their investments in the mining industry and, uh, and, and helping create the manufacturing we need. So I understand that the government of Ontario is investing $100 million annually to strengthen communities across the north through the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation. This corporation is working to build strong and prosperous northern communities. It offers unique programs to help foster hope and opportunity across the north. And the corporation does this by investing in northern businesses and municipalities in a vast majority of these projects have been extremely successful. However, Speaker, I understand these investments come with conditions that recipients are expected to adhere to. So would the minister please elaborate on the Northern Ontario uh, Heritage Fund Corporation and how our government ensures that these funds are used to support job growth in the north? Thank you, Minister. Speaker, again, I thank the member for the question. And I want to clarify an issue that came up earlier this week in the House in relation to the NOHFC, and in particular a company called Great Lakes Graphite. First of all, Speaker, I'll mention that we as a government have taken the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund from $60 million to $100 million annually. And we did that at a time of a recession in the province of Ontario, a renewed and embellished uh, commitment to the people of Northern Ontario. Speaker, loans and grants provided by the NOHFC are attached with strict terms and conditions, which clearly outline that all funds, both loan and grants, as I referenced earlier this week, are required to be repaid in the event of a default. Speaker, in the implication or the narrative that was attempted to be created the other day, I want to address that and make sure that people understand that there is significant third-party due diligence that is attached to all of the private sector applications that flow through the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund. So this board and its, and its operators yes, do sir. a great job of representing Northern Ontario. This fund is a great fund for Northern Ontario, Speaker, and it's important that people know there are terms and conditions attached. Third-party due diligence is done before the money goes out the door. Thank you, Speaker. New question, the member from Halliburton, Corfa Lake, Brock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Minister of Municipal Affairs, as the Minister knows, in my riding, of Minden, the township of Minden Hills has been hit hard by the recent flooding. With water levels expected to continue to rise, businesses are being washed away and people are exasperated. I was in touch with the local funeral home in Minden, and despite placing 10,000 sandbags and deploying 23 sump bumps, Unfortunately, overnight, they lost their battle. The owners felt helpless uh, and that their livelihood literally went underwater. The situation is desperate. The people feel that their government isn't acting to help them in their hour of need. Currently, the government's own website only shows the Ottawa River flood areas as being under assessment. As the minister responsible for the Ontario Disaster Recovery Assistance, what is the Question. government doing to help Ontarians in Minden Hills in this emergency? Thank you. Minister, minister, well, speaker, um, thank you for the question. Let me first um, commend and thank 
um, all of the volunteers and first responders in a number of communities right across Ontario who are dealing with what is, uh, by their own estimation and their own calculations, a massive, historic uh, flooding situation. And, and people will know that it's not only Ontario, Quebec has been massively and significantly affected as well. Uh, before I go to some detail in the supplementary, I would tell the member that Ottawa is being considered, but we have already activated the program when it comes to Renfrew County. They were the first, as I understand it, piece of geography in Ontario that was significantly affected. The team from the ministry was on the ground. They went in. They did their work. The water was so significant in the Renfrew County example that they were unable even to do an assessment. They made a recommendation to me and we activated the program Sir. for Renfrew County. So that one is done and behind us. The work now continues for people to see if they're able to get support through the program. Ottawa is being considered Thank you. and I'll speak more directly to Minden in a second. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And of course, the community has been incredible in its assistance. But I joined the Mayor of Minden yesterday in calling on the Minister to urgently deploy the Ontario Disaster Assessment Team to Minden and the surrounding areas. I was told that the government doesn't deploy assessment teams until after water levels have receded. Not only is this absolutely unacceptable, it is not accurate. People can't wait. They need assistance right now. Will the minister activate the Disaster Recovery Assistance Program immediately to Minden Hills so the people will know that the government will provide assistance for those affected? You need to do it now, Minister. Question. Thank you. Minister? Well, Speaker, no, the answer is simply no. I won't. I won't activate the program right now, and the member should clearly understand this, and we've had an opportunity to talk about it. The assessment team needs to have an ability to get on the ground and create an assessment and define an area of geography and delineate the range and where who might be eligible. Now, as I said to you as well, it's not necessary in certain circumstances for them to do an assessment if the water has not receded, if the rain <laughs> continues. There's possibly an assessment that can, back, can come back to me without them actually being able to see it because the rain has persisted. Speaker, there is work that has to be done, but I caution people Order. not to overestimate or raise expectations on what may be eligible through our program. There's a municipal side and there's a private side. The private side deals simply with the essentials if, in fact, they're eligible. The program is not a replacement for insurance. We understand how traumatic this is for communities and for people in those communities. Speaker. Answer. We have a program that helps, but I'm really concerned with people trying to expedite a process and raising expectations for their community members. I have reached out to a number of mayors and talked to them directly on this file. I would say, Speaker, we're doing what we can. Thank you. The program's in place. We'll let the process unfold. Question, the member from Welland. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Uh, Jack O'Neill is a friend, a longtime community senior activist and president of Friends Over 55 Senior Centre in Port Coburn. It is the oldest independent nonprofit seniors recreation centre in the Niagara region, and the services are dependent on membership fees and donations. Last year, the centre's hydro bill was just over $150 for the month of April. This year, their hydro bill, I have it here, is almost $600. Oh. If this government doesn't put a stop to the sell-off of Hydro One, it's going to be impossible for Jack wow. to afford to pay these bills while still keeping his centre open. What is the Premier going to do today for Jack and for seniors in my community who risk losing programming and services because of skyrocketing Question. hydro bills? Mr. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I know the uh, Minister of Seniors will uh, want to answer in the supplementary as well. But when it comes to um, hydro bills, Mr. Speaker, a cost for electricity, all of those bills in this province will be going down by summer, on average 25 percent, Mr. Speaker. And I know the uh, the honourable member mentioned Hydro One. Hydro One customers with designations of R1 and R2, Mr. Speaker, will see a 40 to 50 percent reduction on their bills as well. So, Mr. Speaker, we are addressing many of the concerns that people have when it comes to hydro bills. And when it comes to seniors, Mr. Speaker, we are ensuring that the Ontario Electricity Support Program is being enhanced by an additional 50 percent 
percent. So on top of the 25 percent and the 40 to 50 percent, when you add in another $540 a year, Mr. Speaker, rates for seniors in this province are coming down significantly and long-lasting, Mr. You. Speaker. Well, Speaker, we've seen the commercials, but we haven't seen the legislation. So we learned yesterday that the Premier is going to sell off more shares of Hydro One. This comes days after the Premier actually defended Hydro One's executive pay increases of 500 per cent. Meanwhile, seniors in my community could lose programming and services. And Jack and the seniors at the, at the senior centre are seeing these skyrocketing hydro bills that are going through the roof. Speaker, will the government put a stop today for further sell-off of Hydro One and put vulnerable seniors ahead of shareholders? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to vulnerable seniors, we've acted with the Fair Hydro Plan, where they're going to see a 25 percent reduction on their bills. There's also the Ontario Electricity Support Program, where they're going to see uh, a 50 percent uh, increase to that uh, rebate, so they can see another $540 off their bills. So when it comes to vulnerable seniors and it comes to vulnerable people in this province, it makes you wonder why that they would put them on the last page of their plan, Mr. Speaker. We have made sure that we are acting. We are acting as quickly as we can to bring forward a comprehensive piece of legislation that will ensure 25 percent reduction by summer. So much so, Mr. Speaker, that the OEB, an in anticipation of our, our plan, have brought forward an additional 9 percent, bringing the reduction right now to 17 percent. When it comes to the sale of Hydro One, we will make sure that we invest that money in infrastructure across this province. Hey, hey. Your question, the member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. We have a lot to celebrate on job growth in this province. In fact, the unemployment rate is the lowest that it's been since 2001. It's at 5.8 per cent, and that news was very well received in my community of Kitchener Centre at a post-budget luncheon that I held. And while that figure is very noteworthy, we know that there are barriers to employment for many people. For example, youth face particular challenges in entering the labour market, finding a job that is full-time or in their community, or relates to what they studied in school. So, Speaker, could the minister please tell us what our province is doing to help young people get ready for the labour market? Thank you, Minister of Advanced uh, Education well, and thank you, Skills Speaker. Development. Thank you to the member from uh, Kitchener Centre. Speaker, we know that our young people have so much to offer this province, and when they can't find good jobs, we all lose out on their endless potential. So, building on what we have accomplished through our youth job strategy, we're now launching Ontario's Career Kickstart Strategy. It invests $190 million over the next three years, Speaker, and creates 40,000 more opportunities for our young people. It will open the doors to real-world hands-on experiences as they transition from the classroom into the workforce. And it gives employers the opportunity to help train and equip the next generation of Ontario's highly skilled workforce with the skills they need to succeed. Speaker, this is something that educators are asking for. Certainly, employers have been asking for it. Sir. But most importantly, it's what young people want and they deserve to kickstart their career. Speaker. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And I'd like to thank the minister for her answer. After the budget was introduced, the leader of the third party was on the radio in my community talking about how life is hard for young people in the province these days, that young people are anxious about their costs as they move from post-secondary education to their first job. And one would hope that they would appreciate the many initiatives that are in the budget, things like pharmacare for those who are under 25, rent controls, and the career kickstart you heard the minister talking about. That's certainly going to make life easier for young adults. But we do know that dealing with student loans can be very daunting for many. So, Speaker, could the minister please tell us what her ministry is doing to help young people manage the costs of their education? Thank you, Minister. Thanks, Speaker. Well, we're, we're definitely pleased that the NDP recognizes the challenge that young people face and the importance of helping young people navigate this changing, Speaker, and this uncertain economy. 
is something we are very much focused on, and that's why we brought forth initiatives in this budget to help young people manage their pocketbook and maximize their prospects. So, as, as we know, we're making tuition in college and university free for or better than free for over 200,000 student speakers. Please finish. I encourage people to visit ontario.ca slash OSAP to see the calculator to find out how much they might be eligible for, Speaker, but that's not all. In this budget, we're making stage yes, changes so that uh, people who have RESPs will not be penalized for saving for their education. They will be exempt from Thank OSAP, you. Speaker. And, and no. New question. The member from the team Power. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Uh, Premier, I appreciated uh, your visit to Ottawa Monday to assess the damage from the severe flooding in our region. My hope is the province will act immediately to help the 346 people who witnessed their homes flood and the 155 who had to be evacuated. This morning, the general manager of the City of Ottawa's Emergency and Protective Services Department, Anthony DeMonte, uh, said that the city has made a formal request for the Disaster Relief Assistance Program, um, even though the uh, team is already on site, it has yet to be activated. Um, we have been dealing with the flooding on the Ottawa for over a week now, and the disaster assistance from the Ontario has been um, slow to respond. Uh, with more flooding on the way, can the Premier tell me and the Ottawa residents uh, that are affected how quickly they can expect the disaster relief uh, assistance program to kick in? Thank you, Premier. Minister of Municipal Affairs. Minister of Municipal Affairs. Speaker, thank you. Thank the member for a question, an opportunity to give some detail for, for people. If the program is recommended for activation, and if the program is activated, there is still a fair bit of work to be done. The, the money or support that may, that may flow to individual homeowners, remembering the program is not a replacement for insurance. On the private side, it deals with essentials only. If it's activated and if they're eligible and if money flows, there is still a time lag there before any money might flow at all. I would make sure you're communicating to your constituents that they're required to have receipts and details that they can submit if the program gets activated. There is a time lag around that. Obviously, that can't be turned around. So if the question is about whether financial assistance will be coming, they need to understand that even if I uh, activated the program five minutes ago, a check doesn't show up in the mail tomorrow. There's still work to be done by the constituents. I would recommend perhaps calling into our ministry, Answer. getting a bit more detail, and we'd be happy to fill in some of the gaps for you. Uh, supplementary. I, I thank the minister very much. Uh, we are expecting more rain this weekend, and residents have been told by the city this morning to keep their sand bags in place as a result. Um, the city's responded very compassionately just this morning, passing a tax relief package for those who are affected by the flood. Over 200 residents or 2,000 residents have volunteered to help in various ways, such as bagging sand, loading trucks, and packing sandbags around homes. Um, again, while I appreciated the, the visit, um, and, and the fact that the disaster relief has not yet been activated. There's other questions abounding about how Hydro One, for example, will be responding to flood victims whose electricity has been disconnected. Um, and compared to the flooding response across the Ottawa River and Gatineau, the province of Ontario has, hasn't been quite as visible. And to the minister's point, it's important that my constituents are aware of some of the, the challenges. So I'm wondering if the minister can lay out concrete steps the province of Ontario is taking to deal with this massive flooding and the timeline Question. that my constituents and my city can expect. Thank you. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Speak. Minister. Well, first of all, um, I'm, I'm very. I thank you for the question because, and uh, you know, as we were there, the Premier, uh, the member from Glengarry Prescott Russell, uh, the member from Ottawa South, and I on Monday, we. Uh, talk to individual. We praise the good work of our volunteers, of our first responder. Uh, the amazing work that's being done to protect the house of everyone is uh, to be commended, Mr. Speaker. And certainly for us is to stay engaged with our municipality. And I know uh, the Minister of Municipal Affairs, his official, and ours at the emergency of Ontario preparedness, we have engaged with our municipality every single day, Mr. Speaker. We are, I would say, almost every hour receiving reports. Answer. And if they need anything, we're responding. When they need a sandbag, we made the call right away and expedite those decisions, Mr. Speaker. Certainly, our goal is to be part and with them. Thank you. Thank you.
there being no deferred votes, this House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.